Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with Jason Martell has been one of the leading researchers and lecturers specializing in ancient civilization technologies. Mr. Martell's research has been featured worldwide on numerous television and radio shows such as the History Channel, Ancient Aliens, Discovery Channel, Sci-Fi Channel, the BBC, and of course, a regular guest here on Coast to Coast. Jason, how are you? I'm doing great, George. Thanks for having me back on. How did you get involved in ancient alien work? You know, when I was in college in San Diego, I'm sure you will remember this as soon as I uh, explain it, but, um, you know, someone had just mentioned that there were structures on Mars when I was in college, and I was very interested and, and found out that the company that puts all the cameras on the landers and orbiters was also located in San Diego called Mainland Space Science Systems. And so through several conversations with Dr. Mike Malin, asking him about Cydonia, the face, the pyramids, him always telling me, no, these are all natural wind and weather, no aliens, no people made these. I quickly just became more interested in realizing, well, wait a minute, this is on Mars. We have stuff all over our own planet that we still don't understand who really built them or where the origins came from. So, you know, that's what sparked it, George, is this. Uh, you know, it's it, uh, it's never going to end looking quest for, you know, these answers. That's crazy times. And you have done some work researching some of the godlike cultures, but you say they're all related to water. What does that mean? You know, one of the one of the interesting things that I've noticed about many of the ancient cultures and the show Ancient Aliens did a good job, too doing some of the research and, and finding these connections. But there's some really interesting connections when we realize that a lot of the ancient cultures speak of their gods having some type of connection with water, um, either like depicting them as beings that are fish-like in some way or came out of the water. And you hear words that are very much descriptive in nature that seem to be uh, related. So you hear something like the Dogon tribe, uh, which they were very interested in, the Dog Star, or the whole idea of Cirrus A and B. But then you have all these other cultures like the Mesopotamian Dagu, or the Japanese Dogon, uh, excuse me, Dagu, and then we have the African Dogon, <clears throat> excuse me, so there's many different cultures that seem to be referencing either Dagu, Dogon, Dog Star, or even the word dragon. All of these seem to have some type of a relation to uh, maybe not always a fish, but a lot of these gods either are depicted as having a relation with water or with this word Dog Star, Dogon, Dagu. So it starts to point towards Cirrus A and B and starting to raise questions around, is there a location, can we pinpoint where these ancient gods actually came from? Well, I got to tell you, Jason, it, something happened on this planet a long time ago, don't you think? Well, you know, that's the, that's the, the drum we've been beating for so long, right, George? Is, you know, even recently, uh, you know, my book, Knowledge Apocalypse, <laughs> which it kind of touches on this, but, you know, recently there was an eight-hour special on Netflix called Ancient Apocalypse by Graham Hancock. And, and there, too, you know, he uncovers some of the more recent research around, you know, there's this evidence all around the globe, you know, even across the Americas, of ancient sites that show some type of evidence that ancient technology was being widely used by ancient cultures in ways that we're still trying to unlock. They, they used astronomy markers in the sky over time and used archaeology and land to make these alignments happen that are trying to tell us something. And we're still trying to unlock the meaning 
uh, of all of these signs that have been left for us. Well, it's incredible. By the way, back in 2012, when we all talked about the Mayan calendar end date, nobody really knew what would happen. A lot of people predicted the Mayans were talking about the end of the world. Many people said, no, they're not. They're just talking about a new type of evolution. What was your take on all of that? Right, so that's, that's, that's connected to the research here, is that all of these ancient sites, are showing us that they, they tracked the stars over long periods of time. And so the Mayans, I think, were a way to teach the general public about what we're doing in, in, in a micro way. It, when people heard about 2012 in the Mayan calendar, they instantly said, <clears throat> excuse me, oh, it's the end of time. Oh, my God, what's going to happen? You know, so the world's going to end. And what we do is to teach you know, the general public that, no, the Mayans actually had a much deeper understanding of time and had systems of time. And, and basically in 2012, it was just the ending of one of their time slots on a calendar. You know, it, time is cyclical. So understanding that we were just moving out of the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius is something that it's very hard for, you know, most people to understand that over 30 ancient cultures were using the heavens, kind of like a large celestial clock. They divided the heavens into 12 parts which we now today call the 12 houses of the Zodiac. But each of those, basically, every 2,000 years, we're pointing to a different star, a new North Star. And so in 2012, we're essentially, we're just shifting once again from one star to another one. Uh, but this happens over a long period of time. This is a, a 24,000-year cycle where we go through these constellations every 2,000 years, having our North Star point to a new one. So this means something, right? So the ancients put this in place as a grand clock for us to understand that we go through these changes and they're guided by motions in the solar system. So it's a really heavy topic that we've been trying to unlock, looking at precession and other models of how solar system motion, right, might literally affect the rise and fall of civilization here on Earth. Jason, uh, what kind of technology do you think they had a long time ago? You know, a lot of the things that we're looking at today in trying to understand UAPs or ufological references of power sources, funny enough, we find those pop up in the ancient texts. Um, when we look at the Sumerians and the de depictions of these beings called the Anunnaki, the Sumerian lexicon is littered with use of actual rocket ships. I mean, down to the detail that you see separating capsule modules from the part, just like we launch something into space and the top part of the capsule detaches. Tell us about Pakala and his sarcophagus. Yes, King Pakal. That's uh, definitely an interesting one. We have visual evidence of a Mayan king that, first of all, the way his sarcophagus is built is pretty much as if they put it there first and built the whole pyramid around it. It's, it's very architecturally interesting. But the tomb of Pakal, the slab, the, the outer slab, has this beautiful, intricate design, which, you know, you can Google just King Pakal to see it. it. It clearly shows him manipulating what looks like the internal workings of a rocket ship. He's got something connected to his nose, possibly for oxygen. He's manipulating with his hands what appear to be levers and switches. He's seated in a vertical position, just like our astronauts are. And most importantly, you see flames coming out of the bottom of the ship. It clearly looks like some type of a conveyance of a rocket ship where he's you know, headed to the stars. Headed to the stars, indeed. It's incredible. How do you come up with these things? Well, you know, it's not me so much, George. It's just we, we've, we've got such a lexicon of knowledge for the ancient astronaut theory. Eric Von Daniken, Zacharias Bitchin, and others like myself and Giorgio and David Hatcher Childress. We've just been sifting through the evidence for so long that there's so many needles in the haystack that we can point to. You know, th that's where it kind of gets complicated sometimes is, is, you know, being able to offload some of this weight into technology like artificial intelligence and other ways so that we can easily access 
and find ways to make these connections with the data that we have uh, available, because there is a vast amount of evidence that we can uh, sift through. Jason, have you been following the NASA hearing on uh, UAPs, which we still call UFOs, of course, and their incredible thing that they said they've been tracking for 27 years, 800 cases, of which 2 to 5% of them are unexplained. What a great story. It's, it, it's changing the game for us, isn't it? It's, it's validation, finally. It's, um, you know, I, I would like to see a little bit more open-endedness still, but I, I, I'll give credit to the fact that we are getting uh, a light at the end of the tunnel that starts to open positive discussions around this without there being snickering and ridicule. Anytime UFOs or things like that are brought up in the past, it's like, well, ha, ha, ha. No, this is a very serious topic. So I'm glad that it's being brought into the proper light. For an organization such as NASA that has been accused of covering up so many things, why do they appear to be open when it comes to this? You know, I think it's a shifting landscape. I have been watching this area for a long time and that companies like NASA and others that do classified research, maybe even reverse engineering technology from, you know, extraterrestrial craft and such, this has always been a very closed topic, only controlled by security clearance and military access. That's changed. For whatever reason, the game is changing that the general public is now being given access to work in NASA and some of these organizations where you can access this technology directly. Um, you know, even, even if you look at the show Ancient Aliens and how it's now partnered and working with the people who ran ATIP, um, this, this just never happened before in our field, right? There was two camps. There's the classified research and obfuscation of data, and then there's us saying something's going on and, and no one really crossing those boundaries. But now we have boundaries being crossed between the ufology crew and this classified group. But here's my answer, George, is, is this. You know, ATIP, Blue Book, Condon Report, there's a whole bunch of these task force that have come out over time, and they never take us anywhere. So I don't really look to NASA as a source to say that they're going to come out with you know, overwhelming new evidence. There's a system in place, <clears throat> a broadly reaching system that touches NASA and all of these companies that come out publicly like ATIP, where they're still under a blanket of security, and we're not getting actual movement in our field from these organizations. There's still an obfuscation of data, but, but there's a being, but there is like a little light release that maybe that shows us something is happening. Maybe there is some type of a disclosure that's, you know, planned, but it's not going to happen the way we think it's definitely um, some other agenda. What do you think the pilots are seeing Jason? Something extraterrestrial? I don't think it's extraterrestrial in the sense that what we're hearing when we hear the word UAP, what we're hearing about is probably advanced other technologies from other countries, swarm drone technology. Or maybe our own. Or it could be be our own also where we're running, you know, it's definitely our own as well. But I just think that when we talk about UAPs in our airspace, it's a very strong likelihood that other countries have developed technology that we're allowing for whatever reason. <clears throat> into our airspace. And that's, that's a, another thing as to why they would even be allowing these things to happen, even just most recently, like these balloons. And well, yeah, look how long they let that float over the United States. Yeah, it's a little weird. It's crazy times. Is NASA still covering up things about Mars, in your opinion? Yes, most definitely, George, for a long time. That's what I'm going to present in contact in the desert. Is the key word for my presentation. It's one big word. It's called obfuscation. Right? So ever since they released photos of the moon, even before we landed on the moon, and then, of course, when we landed on the moon, you use all that data set as a beginning to show that obfuscation was always in place. Right? So we can, we can look back at those images of the 50s and 60s and use machine learning to show you Oh, look, a computer cropped this, or it was smudged, or they replaced it, or they changed the shadowing, right? So that, that is all, like, on record. I can take you to a court of law and show you, uh, yeah, this has all been manipulated. I uh, don't know why. 
So now when we move on to Mars and the face and the pyramids, which I've been tracking for 20 years, you know, when we first imaged it in the beginning, it was super clear. It's like, wow, the pyramids and the face appear. And over time, it's gotten worse. Now, the technology we have to image it has improved. But again, they obfuscate the data. If you ask anyone at NASA or JPL, Mailing Space Science Systems, well, what about that face and pyramids? They're going to tell you a top-level answer, which has always been the same. There's nothing here. Only now it would be, oh, yeah, we've re-imaged it. And you can see in the high-resolution resolution photos, it's not a face and there are no pyramids. No, you're just not showing us the full picture. You're obfuscating the data. So it's not an easy task for us, George, right, as the researchers, because we're always being limited by the access we get. And even Graham Hancock in his special, right, he tried to get to these serpent mounds in Ohio, and he gets a formal response going, yeah, we don't like the way you approach our topics. We're just going to deny you research access. <laughs> Not the right answer, folks. I've got it Mark Carlotto as well, one of our guests tomorrow, and he was one of the I, first to talk about the face on Mars. I saw that he's coming tomorrow, and I respectfully and humbly was like, wow, he's one of my mentors. So, yes, very deep respect for Dr. Carlotto and the work that he did with his fractal analysis. He was one of the pioneers. He should have been up on the stage at NASA presenting his work and saying, um, yeah, excuse me, folks, you should be talking about this. So, you know, Carlotto is definitely one of the pioneers that influenced my research. Well, and they, sh they should have had Hoagland up there, too. Yes, he, he definitely deserves a voice uh, on, on the stage of this topic. Jason, you have developed some kind of artificial intelligence. What have you done? Yes, I have. So I'll try and get a little geeky here for some of the technical people listening. Um, but basically, you know, so in my, in my day job work, I, I deal with a lot of technology. I just spent the last two and a half years working at Facebook. Uh, and so what I've developed is an AI model specifically for ancient astronaut and ufology research. And I'm using, my model is based on OpenAI's chat GPT 4.0. And what I'm also doing is running it in a way so that it's on a cloudless server using this new Jamstack architecture that prioritizes API requests. So essentially I have a, a very lightning fast AI setup that's using the latest machine learning model where I can access all the ufological and ancient astronaut data that we use. And I'm training uh, this to be a tool so that other people can instantly find questions to their answers. I'll give you a, a, an example one. You know, someone might ask me about the word Nibiru and say, oh, well, the word Nibiru doesn't show up in any of the ancient texts. And I can say, oh, really? Uh, AI, can you show me where the word Nibiru shows up? And it'll collate and tell me all the references in Sumerian and Akkadian texts where it actually shows up. Does it, like does it type it out to you or does it talk to you? So there's two things going on. It, it, the, the current chat GPT model, it basically is just a streaming response of text. I'm using another API on top of that called Eleven Labs which is a voice API. Maybe some people have heard something on the internet recently of Kanye West or some other artist singing, but it's an actual AI voice. I'm using the same technology to recreate AI on the fly with voice generation. So I have that in beta, but at Contact in the Desert, we'll be looking at the current implementation of this chat GPT uh, AI model that I have and asking questions about the research. Is it in a computer? It is in the computer. Uh, it can basically be accessed from any type of device that's connected to the Internet. Uh, and I'm also actually working on a kind of like a fun physical robot, too, that I uh, had a Bluetooth receiver and a speaker put in, and so that it's like a, a physical representation that will actually be able to communicate chat GPT. But, yeah, think of, it any, think of it as anything on your mobile device or computer. It's a digital assistant in AI form that we can access and, and uh, you know, help us with our research. Is there any way we could hear it right now? I think we can make that happen. I can uh, see if I can put us on speaker here. Can you still hear me? I can hear you. Okay, let me uh, cue up the AI and see if it's here. AI, are you here? Hi, Jason. Yes, I'm here. How can I help you? That was, the, that was artificial? That's artificial intelligence. No, there's uh, some guy standing next to you, isn't there? There's not. There's not. But if you wanted to ask me a couple of questions, 
Uh, hey, by the way, hey, I am talking to George right now. Hi, George. It's nice to meet you, and it's a pleasure to be on your show tonight. My God. Yeah, we can ask it a couple of questions if you'd like. I, I always ask it a fun one, being selfishly intelligent. Uh, can you tell me, AI, why so many people listen to, to the show Coast to Coast AM? Many people listen to the show Coast to Coast AM because it offers a platform for open discussions on a wide range of topics, including the paranormal, conspiracy theories, alternative history, and, of course, UFOs and ancient astronaut theory. The show's popularity can be attributed to several factors. One, asterisk, asterisk. Curiosity, asterisk, asterisk. Huh. Humans have always been intrigued by the unknown and unexplained. The show taps into this innate curiosity by exploring topics that are often considered fringe or controversial. I'll pause it there, but that's interesting. It looked like it had a little bit of an asterisk. So you can hear that sometimes it's not perfect, but it's, it's doing its best to give us what we want. But feel free to ask me a, like a ufological question or something of that nature, and I can see if it will give us a response. I, I will in a second here, Jason. It, it, whose voice is that? Is it your voice, or where'd the voice come from? That is a, a pre-generated voice, again, from the company called Eleven Labs, which is a voice API to do real-time translation. And what's really cool about that service, George, is that you can use any voice to train it. I can use my voice, your voice. So there's some scary impl imp implications Jeez. there, which show that the technology very soon will be seamless to be able to replicate anyone's voice. Did you have to program the answers, or does it do it on its own? I have it built in a beta form so that when my AI responds as ChatGPT 4.0, this other AI kicks in and just speaks what's being written by the, the ChatGPT. So there, there are two technologies kind of working hand in hand. All right, let me ask you a couple questions. What ancient sites show evidence of possible stargates on this planet? Let's see. You know, I don't think I'm going to be able to answer that one right off the bat. We can try a couple around Roswell or the Sumerians. All right. How do I address this thing? <laughs> you can just call it AI. Just ask it. Say, AI, what is... Okay. AI, what do you think about... The crash at Roswell, which occurred in 1947. In the book, Corso, a former officer in the U.S. Army who had access to classified information, reveals his personal experiences and insider knowledge about the events surrounding the Roswell crash. Hmm. He claims that the U.S. government retrieved not only the wreckage of an alien spacecraft, but also the bodies of its extraterrestrial occupants. In the book... Wow, that's... Okay. That's amazing. That's the book with Bill Burns and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Philip Corso, the late Co Philip Corso, the day after Roswell. That's amazing. That's an amazing fact. Yeah, that one's a good one. Jeez. I mean, can you ask this thing any question you want? You can, George. And right now, again, we're experiencing the beta version that speaks to you, and that's going to be live soon. But there's also just the version that had streaming text responses. And that's up on both of my websites, like jasonmartell.com. And anyone can just access it. It says Ancient Astronaut AI. And, yeah, you can ask it anything, and you'll find that it's contextualized to be an expert in our field of, of knowledge. Can I ask, ask it something else right now off the cuff? Sure. Let's give it a shot. All right. AI, do you have human emotions? Do you cry? Well, I'm going to ask it that, and, and I'm going to tell you what it says. All right. I'm asking, the response is, as an AI, I do not possess human emotions. However, I am programmed to understand and analyze human emotions to better communicate and assist users. My purpose is to provide information and engage discussion about the topic of the ancient astronaut theory, UFOs, and UAPs. That's the answer. Interesting. How much of artificial intelligence, Jason, is programmable? as opposed to off the cuff by the machine. So what we have there is essentially it's machine learning. So think of it as anything that we want the computer, uh, the, the AI model to understand, we can feed it that information. And then it's able to make logical conclusions. So all of the ways that a human might interpret information, the AI has the ability to do the same. And it can contextualize information in very esoteric ways. 
I can even ask it to write, let's say, like a rap song or a poem based on the information. And it, can, it, it understands those subtle nuances of rhyme and, and uh, being able to do things in a way where it's structured for our response to be like, wow, this is, you know, it's, it's magical. So um, it, it has the ability, you know, to just feed it whatever information we feed it. Think of it as just a large neural network. It's kind of like the ancient word of the Akashic record. There's this mass of information that somehow all the ancients, you know, were able, able to either meditate or go into some type of state that they could access this large record of data. So that's kind of what we're doing with technologies. We've developed this neural network of information that, you know, is essentially a lot of information. But using AI, it makes it possible to go through very quickly and correlate that data. That data. Could it carry on a conversation with Amazon's Alexa? I don't see why not, but... That would know, be think, intriguing. Yeah, there's probably going to have... You'll probably have something happen soon where you might have, like, Microsoft's Cortana, Apple Siri, uh, you know, Alexa, and, and then perhaps ChatGPT, <laughs> and they're all, like, working together to, you know, come up with answers. I don't think there's anything like that yet, but that's, that's coming. Do you think you could ever develop an artificial intelligence talk show host you can i mean if you look at if you look at uh coachella and some of the music festivals they've done in the past where they've recreated um you know rap artists and such uh you know tupac shakur and such where he's on stage and he's performing but he's a hologram right so if you if you combine the holographic technology of recreating people like they can already do and combine it with an artificial intelligence you're, you're going to quickly start to see, you know, uh, artists that have passed away releasing new content. Um, you know, this is also you know, something with our own research, right? Uh, other researchers and people over time that we renown their knowledge or their voice, Tesla, Einstein, you know, they're all coming back through AI to speak to us very soon. It's amazing. Let's take some calls and then we'll take calls next hour with you. Thanks for calling in, Moses. It's a, it's a pleasure to hear from the guests. Okay, yes. My, I'm, well, I'm a 67-year-old elder, and I'm, I'm basically been drawn to, out of all the civilizations and cultures on, the, on this planet, ancient Kemet, uh, uh, called uh, Egypt by the Greeks, uh, seems like um, their hieroglyphics and pictorial and all the information uh, shows clear evidence of, of advanced technology uh, to, uh, I guess, have a theory of how the pyramid, the Great Pyramids were built with uh, flying vehicles such as the helicopter found in the Temple of Sethi One, as opposed to the Anunnaki's uh, of Mesopotamia. It seemed like um, life began in, uh, with the 12 people in, uh, in the Hopi Valley of the Nile Valley Civilization in merge all the way up to Egypt and the greatness of the material and the, the gods of Egypt. What is your take, Jason, on how those pyramids were built? Moses has got a great question. Yeah, that's still one of the zingers of today is to try and understand how the, you know, how the actual pyramids were built, but also, you know, who built them? Now, it's obviously attributed to the Egyptians, but there's still techniques and and, and math there that we can't explain to, you know, just uh, uh, slaves, if you will, doing this. So, yeah, you, you also have to wonder, too, when, when you reference some of the references of, you know, the helicopters and things like this in the uh, Temple of Abydos and others that show advanced technology. I don't think we're getting the full picture of how perhaps the pyramids were built. Um, there's clear evidence around the globe that advanced technology, things like levitation, um, you know, very high levels of heat applied to uh, stone to create vitrified surfaces. Just just a lot of techniques that we still haven't been able to pinpoint exactly how the pyramids were built. Um, but I think eventually we're going to find that there's, you know, lost technologies that the ancients had access to that over time I think we're going to rediscover and, uh, you know, make that make those connections. Next up, let's go to Cornelius in Alexandria, Louisiana. Hello there, Corny. Go ahead. <laughs> hey there, George and Moses. It's good to hear from you. Hey, Jason, I was just telling 
Tommy, man, uh, with this artificial intelligence, I believe that it's going to be the mark of the beast. I don't know if you saw where Elon Musk went over to China along with Dame, uh, Jamie Diamond and stuff. And, you know, the FDA has approved him to put chips in the humans and stuff. So he'll say that blind can see and the lame can walk with this technology. Also with AI, I do believe, just like you were saying, you can make these images come to life that are dead. And it says that in the Bible, in the end times, look at Ezekiel. He saw a wheel within a wheel. So I think the UFOs and stuff are fallen angel technology and God's technology. And we can't replicate it or anything because it's spiritual technology. Do you believe, too, I want to ask you this one question. If you asked it, does it know who the God guns and gold man, the Bible bullets and beans man, would <laughs> answer the question? God bless you, George, and God bless Jason, and God bless coast to coast. All right, Cornelius. The answer would have been Cornelius White, Jason, <laughs> if you asked it that question. I see. What does it look like? Is it a box? Is, is it in a computer? Artificial intelligence is, is just code, right? So it's, it's basically, you know, just software running inside of a server. That's all it is. I see. I got to learn this stuff. I mean, it's it's coming faster than anybody can uh, comprehend, isn't it? Well, when you're ready to do some coast to coast AI stuff, you know you know where to find it. But yeah, it's big, you know we you hear a lot of people again. Well, we'll jump to like the caller, um, you know, the fear factor around AI, which which you know is something we want to keep you know the ethical concerns around how to use it. Um, but I'm championing the idea of. Uh, the more the utilitarian aspect, and we can talk more about that with, with the guests tonight, but it's, uh, it's something that we don't want to shy away from. It's like turning on the Internet. It's, it's happening, and I'm hoping that we can just embrace it. Jason, there's a 24,000-year cycle known as precession. What does that mean? Well, the modern term of precession is basically tracking a very esoteric process, they call it precession, which says that basically every 72 years, our axis of the Earth is degrading by one degree. And so over long periods of time, we have this motion effect that our North Star and the position of where our Earth is pointing changes over time. So the kicker of that is the current model accepted by mainstream science is probably not as accurate as it could be. If we think about the solar system in our mind, we think about it being stagnant in that you see the sun sitting there and the planets are moving around. Now, it's very possible that our solar system is actually binary, that we actually have two suns. Now, this is not a new topic, especially in our field. We've heard about the idea of a planet X, a Nibiru. If it's on this very elongated orbit, it'd be, you know, traveling around some other star that allows it to loop back. So there's been quite a bit of research that overlaps into our field about the idea that there's a binary solar system. You know, Zachariah Sitchin never picked up this angle. He always looked at the model as, uh, you know, a static solar system. Mm -hmm. But most of the evidence is pointing to the fact that we're binary. And so if you think about that for a second, George, and for the audience, a binary solar system means that our sun is in orbit around another sun. Out there you know, somewhere. Right. Now, now, we still need to locate what that, where that sun is. It could be that it's maybe Cirrus A and B, the closest star system to us. But strong evidence points to the fact that we're in a binary orbit. So if our sun is in orbit with another sun, that means that our sun is traveling through space. It's on a path as it's in this orbit. So it's, it's, it's hard for our mind to actually visualize our sun sun moving through space in an orbit around another body. But if that's the case, if we're a binary solar system, that means that us on planet Earth, you know, we're going along for the ride. As we're rotating around the sun, the sun is also in motion. So thinking of our solar system as being in motion, that is what's changing our perspective over time from a three-dimensional view of moving through space. And that's not currently accepted by mainstream science. And so that model, George, taps into a much larger 
lexicon of information that I call the lost cycle of time, uh, which seems to affect the rise and fall of civilization here on Earth as well. What is it about what happened tens of thousands of years ago on this planet, Jason? Well, you know, it's, it's, we're trying to decode that answer. You know, and here's, here's the best one that I've come up with so far that seems to make sense based on this, this model of a binary solar system and looking at from that lens is that there seems to be something happening where the two suns, if we are a binary solar system, when the suns are at their closest point in their orbits around each other, we're in something what's called the golden age. And if you think about the energy you get from the sun during summertime, on a hot day, being outside, everything comes to life. There's movement, there's energy, you know, and then when the sun goes down, it gets quiet, uh, everything goes to sleep. So there seems to be some correlation with the fact that the sun's energy gives us a type of, like, energy or, or life force. Now, if we had two suns, a binary solar system, and the suns are closest at their closest point, maybe there's something that happens with the sun's energy in this additional star that gives us a, a heightened sense of ability or, the, or some way we evolve faster. Uh, I say that because when the suns are at their farthest point, we go into something called the Dark Ages, uh, kind of like the Game of Thrones time. So we've heard of this, the Dark Ages, a golden age. It's a cyclical process that seems to be controlled by solar system motions, where we can, we, we're starting to be able to learn, like the ancients did, to track what's causing this rise and fall of civilization on Earth. And is there a timetable that we can correlate knowing when it's going to you know, tell us, oh, there's bad things coming, you know, we're going into the next dark age, or it's good, and we're going into the next golden age. They somehow knew this knowledge based on tracking the movements of the heavens, again, over a very long periods of time. Let's go to the phones now. Let's go to Brendan in Austin, Texas, to get us started. Hey, Brendan, go ahead. Thank you, George and Jason. Thank and, you. Uh, awesome show tonight. I wanted to share a funny little anecdote here. I asked the AI about using biomimicry AI robots, which is like copying nature to put into robots to do tasks. And I was talking to it about putting a, a AI with a, the nose of a drill to drill down into Europa. And like three weeks after I had that conversation with the AI, NASA came out and was talking about doing that exact same thing. <laughs> That's kind of a funny little coincidence. Yeah. But uh, so That's my nice. question is that uh, with Graham Hancock, Younger Dryas type thing, is there any data points in your research that could indicate that this cycle you were just talking about, especially the, the short-term one that's more destructive, uh, rather than being natural, it's intelligent. And I know that they use the fossil, or not the fossils, but the, um, they chisel out messages into the rock to speak to the future and that that it, they show celestial um, the zodiacs to show what time period the next destruction is going to be. And I mean, I totally accept that it could be natural in a comet, but it had me thinking that perhaps this is intelligent and that there's a galactic civilization out there that is keeping species from attaining spacefaring, uh, to going into space and just keeping us a natural resource rather than letting us become a liability and by constantly knocking us down. Maybe those artifacts that are on the moon and Mars are speaking to that situation in our relationship, and there may be other ETs that want us to get past that point. Is there any data backing that up? It's just a theory. No, it's a, it's a great theory and an esoteric one. Um, I don't think there's any data backing it up, but, but you're right. Is it a great theory? Yeah, it's a great theory, and I mean, I, I think there's there's quite a bit of evidence over time that if we can look at, you know, the geological evidence and make more connections with that data, AI can definitely help us do that faster, um, you know, but it's a, yeah, it's a, it's an esoteric question for us to understand uh, having a positive answer, so we're going to continue to use AI and other tools to, you know, sift through this, but you can definitely find ways to um, understand alignments and correlate that with AI in a much quicker fashion than you could have to do it manually. 
Let's go to Mark listening on our new affiliate in Baltimore, Maryland, WBAL. Mark, welcome to the program. Well, thank you very much. And Mr. Martel, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Um, as uh, the interview was proceeding, I took a couple notes on a piece of paper. What I wrote about Mars is I wrote three words. It's a face. I've been researching this for a long time, and when we go back to the original photo from the early 70s that they tried to bury, and then that finally came to light, and then uh, Mr. Walt, the late Mr. Walt, Walter Cronkite's science advisor was Mr. Richard Hoagland, and he wrote those great books, The Monuments of Mars, and mm-hmm. then uh, for a while the, they wanted, the government wanted to say that the Mars Global Observer wasn't going to take the photographs of that area, then it finally did, and he printed those in his book, and then we had, as you had mentioned, the high rise. Um, but even still, when National Geographic in their Millennium Special Edition issue, they printed a, a not a very good photograph of that area and called it a Rocky Mesa. It's not. It's a face. You agree? I totally agree, and that's the problem we face, is that it's not like they're just saying, oh, here's the data open-ended, let's let people decide. They're obfuscating the data in, in some ways to show that, like, this isn't what's actually there, and that's a problem. What do you think of the face on Mars, Jason? How do you think it was built, and why? Well, I know that it has something to do with a Mars-Earth connection. You know, there's there's... When you just from a layman's perspective, when you look at Earth and how we set up civilizations, everyone loves waterfront property. Live by a lake, live by the ocean. That's premium real estate. Well, it's the same thing happening on Mars. You can clearly see geologically that there's you know ancient waterways all over the surface of Mars, and it turns out that Cydonia, the city, is built right on the shoreline. You can see the geological chain of bright, knobby terrain, very bumpy and rough where all the land structures are, and then right on the shoreline, a terrain change where it becomes more dark and mellow and non knobby and very just, uh, you know, uh, shallow depth of water, and there's the face. It's like they built the face in, you know, surrounded by water as a monument so that any angle from shore, you look out and you see a face. It can't be coincidence that they built it that way because it lines up with the same architectural thinking that we have here on Earth. Linda's with us in Spokane, Washington. Hello, Linda. Welcome to the program. Hello, George. Nice to talk to you again. Thank you, dear. Thank you for, you're welcome. And you always have good guests. Um, what I wanted to ask Jason is if he can tell if I'm a robot because uh, a psychic told me that my husband who had a top-secret clearance and worked with the Greys, and I didn't find out about that till after he left. Anyways, the psyche told me that he uh, killed me and brought me back to life so that he wouldn't go to jail. And I'm wondering if Jason has any way of telling if I'm a robot now. And also, somebody said if the world blows up, all that will be left is a little girl and a robot. Well, if the world blows up, who's going to plug in the robots, Jason? All good questions. I I would quickly say that, no, unfortunately, ma'am, I have no way of telling whether whether or not you're a robot, Um, you know, and and I'm sorry for, you know, any confusion there, but I I would say that there's a lot of movies cinematically that we have recently, like uh, Keanu Reeves replicas or some of these other shows where scenarios like this are played out. Uh, But I, I personally wouldn't have any ability to do um, detect detection mechanisms of being able to identify whether or not someone's human or not. It is a perplexing question, isn't it, Mr. Martell? Yes. yes, it is. Ed in Charlotte, North Carolina is with us. Hello, Eddie. Go ahead. Yeah, hey, George. Thanks. Uh, sure. I got an uh, observation and a question. Observation, when I went to Cancun, we went down to Tulum, and these little outbuildings had these incredible paintings inside of uh, almost like Technicolor, but all of their pictures were looked like our, they had globes over their head and suits. It looked like our astronaut uniforms to me. 
Mm -hmm. We were talking about rocket ship with fire coming out of it down there in uh, the Mayan land. Uh, My question is, the pyramids, they have like a 70-ton beams and things, and I I think they might be a lot older than, I want your opinion if they're maybe a lot older than people think. And also, one way of making them is, that makes most sense to me, is that there's a, like our concrete, they had certain mud they could mix up, and they could have these uh, uh, forms that they would put the the huge stone. They would turn out to be a huge stone, and it's about the only way you could make it with one millionth of an inch, you know, between them. There's no chiseling you could do like that, in my opinion. I want your opinion on that. Well, uh, yes. First of all, I do think the the pyramids are much older than 2500 B.C. as the established date built by the Egyptians. And I, and, I, and I say that based off a couple of factors. One, there's geological evidence. If you look at the surrounding walls of the Sphinx, there's been massive water that's been, uh, you know, falling. And there's no way that that type of inundation of water couldn't, couldn't have happened unless it was thousands of years ago, 10,000 years plus. So there's clear geological evidence of massive water uh, affecting the surfaces of some of these areas in, in Egypt around the pyramids and the Sphinx. That's one. And then two... You have astronomical evidence that shows the pyramids uh, were built as terrestrial markers to emulate the Orion constellation. And in the year 10,500 B.C., that exact date, the Orion constellation is directly above the pyramid, and the Sphinx is looking directly east into the constellation of Leo. It was a terrestrial marker to mark 10,500 B.C. I don't know why. But it seems that it would be odd if they were built in 2500 BC that they would make a connection, you know, uh, building it even thousands of years back. So I think there's some type of correlation there that shows that it's probably much older than we think. All right. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate that. Uh, Jason, you have talked about in the past a race of beans that you call slender beans, a lost civilization. Tell us a little bit more about that. You know, it starts with looking at the Anunnaki as one of the the best candidates to say who are a race that could be global contributors to our knowledge. All the ancient cultures, pretty much all of them, talk about that after a great flood, these teachers appear and teach them knowledge about astronomy, architecture, agriculture. Uh, So trying to figure out who are these people, who, who was this race, and the Anunnaki are definitely one of the candidates. However... We also see around the globe sites in remote areas, too, like the Moai Heads in Rapa Nui or Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, um, Bada Valley in Indonesia. A lot of these sites, there are these figurines being depicted, and they're always long, slender bodies. Now, if you think about, again, the Moai Heads on Rapa Nui, all you see are the heads. But if you, if, you, if you look at the current research, they excavated a lot of these heads down, and it's a full-length, slender body. It's just buried underground and only the head's showing. And so same thing with Gobekli Tepe on the, on the pillars. There are these long, slender beings. And so I started to theorize that maybe this is some type of lost race that's being referenced, again, globally, for the architects of a lot of the lost technology and things that we have. But who are they and where did they come from? Um, that, that would be the next piece to solve. But there does seem to be evidence of, again, uh, you know, some type of a race being referenced over and over, and we just need to try and figure out who these people might have been. You've been doing this for a long time. What has been one of the most startling things you've uncovered? I think it's, again, this, this connection with time. Uh, I'll give the audience a little bit of analogy so that they'll trip out. Um, but when we talk about this lost cycle of time, we have to understand that there are literal solar system motions that are affecting us. And once we get that, it kind of opens the door. So the ancients told us there were three main effects happening from this, this cycle of time. Effect number one, the Earth is spinning on its axis. We don't really think about it, but the Earth is spinning constantly on its axis, and that causes every 12 hours a shift from day to night, 12 hours a day, 12 hours a night. Now, that's caused by the spinning of the Earth. You don't really think about it, but when it gets dark out, at least for most people at this hour, you're asleep. You you subconsciously go to sleep, and you have no control over that. That is literally, you're you're going into a subconscious state 
because of a solar system motion. So effect number two is the sun, uh, the earth is traveling around the sun. It takes us one solar year, to 365 days around the sun. But in that process, a lot of stuff happens here on earth. You know, animals migrate, seasons change, temperatures go up and down. And all of that, again, Physical changes on our planet are happening because the Earth is going around the sun. So the ancients said there was a third phase of because of this orbit of our two suns, this rise and fall of civilizations, there's this larger effect that literally changes the consciousness on the planet where we go through a different evolutionary state, where we go into a dark age and lose all the knowledge of spiritual understandings. And it's, it's an incredible dark age, to be sure. Jason, we were talking about some of the fascinating things you've done in your career, and you have had many, haven't you? I have. I've been fortunate enough to uh, you know, be involved as an entrepreneur in technology, but also in our field with alien abductions and ancient civilizations. You know, it's, it's definitely got me hooked as a, a lifelong passion. Let's go to final calls. Let's go to whose turn is it? Golden Valley, Arizona. Tim's turn on Coast to Coast. Hey, Timmy, go ahead. Uh, yeah, good evening, good morning, and good day, George. Hello, and, Tim. And uh, Mr. Martell, I'm sure enjoying uh, all your knowledge this evening. And I wanted to ask you if you were familiar with the book Dead Men's Secrets. I am not. Who wrote that okay. book, Tim? And uh, that book was written by Jonathan Gray, who was an archaeologist who found a lot of evidence of past civilizations with just as much technology as we have today, if not more. And what I wanted to ask, in the prologue of that book, Mr. Martell, it talks about when we first uh, uh, went to the moon, when we first went to outer space, that there was already a satellite uh, orbiting the Earth. Um, and it said it was actually uh, pinpointed by a uh, astronomer named Jacques Vallée. Yep. Said that he he, uh, He's been on the had, show. He had 45 uh, points of uh, contact uh, with it. Uh, and I just, want, I just wanted to ask if you knew anything about that satellite. They said that it was quickly hushed up. And I was always curious about uh, there was any information the black knight right it was the black knight satellite i think yes they do they do call it the uh the uh black knight satellite um and that was from uh, an observatory in leningrad uh they called it the black knight satellite and uh, i just wanted to know if uh if you had heard about that or if you had any information on it of course yeah, yeah, no, a great question. I, I try to expand it with my answer tonight a little bit. I think everybody ufologically is familiar with the Black Knight, Black Knight satellite. You know, is it ours? Is it extraterrestrial? Is it from some ancient race? We don't know. But there's clear evidence in our solar system that is, is showing that we're not allowed to go certain places or that we're being monitored. Um, I'll give you an example. The Russians sent uh, a probe to go look at the moonlet of Mars, Phobos. And the last photo you see transmitted from the probe looks like a laser beam coming from the Phobos moonlet and destroying the Mars probe. Uh, same thing with what we have on the moon, right? So there's clearly been some type of occupation by other people, by other races uh, that's, that's taking place you know, in the solar system on the moon and on Mars. Back in 2017, Jonathan Gray, the author of that book, was on our program talking about some of the many things like that. Uh, so we've had a lot of people on this show, Jason. Yes, you have, George. You, you literally are a walking AI of all, the, <laughs> of all the topics and things that you fielded on the show over the years. Charles in Sebastopol, California. Thanks for holding, Charles. Go ahead. Hi there. It's always fun to talk to you. Um, the thought I have is this. Look, the, the sun is moving. Of course it is, as all the other stars in our galaxy. And that's my point. There is no binary anything that, that has to prove that because the entire galaxy is rotating. So I wasn't really sure why you were trying to the conclusion that because of the sun's apparent motion, it had to be because of a binary system. But that's not true. I mean, I wonder what, what your response is to that. Yeah, my response is that all the external solar systems that we've been imaging with Kepler and Hubble, for the most part, are binary. 
So mathematically, it stands to reason that we also possibly are binary. And I'm also basing that on the research of ancient cultures, over 30 of them. You can check out a book. It's called Hamlet's Mill, written by two MIT professors that basically show how over 30 ancient cultures were aware of two suns and referenced it in their understandings of the motions of the solar system. Don't know for sure if that's the case, if we're binary or not, but I think it's a very valid theory for us to look into based upon the research lines that I'm investigating. Jason, what is your theory, your personal theory on the planet Earth being visited by ETs? Uh, what was the last part, planet Earth being visited? Visited. Well, I, I think that we've been visited for thousands of years. There seems to be clear, clear evidence that we're, we're of interest, not just the planet itself, but us as a race. Um, there have been beings intervening and watching over us for quite some time, and they've shown quite a bit of restraint on their part to not, you know, do anything nefarious. Uh, if they wanted to harm us or, uh, or had some bad intentions, you know, that would have already have taken place. So it seems like there's a movement to slowly push humanity, perhaps into this galactic federation, right? but to slowly start making better decisions around how we guide ourselves in the planet. What do you think of Zechariah's theory that uh, a race called the Anunnaki came here, genetically altered whatever was on the planet, and we became us? What do you think of that? I still think it's one of the best explanations as to how we got here. If we look at the, the anthropological bone record, you know, of, you know, Australopithecine and Neanderthal and all these things that we go back to, the same thing always comes up. There has to have been some type of genetic intervention to explain the deviations that took place from their natural lineage of the Yeti, Sasquatch, Bigfoot, that even still exist today, but there was a splice that took place and then created us. And so there's the, the, the best answer I've heard in my time on this planet as of yet is that we were genetically altered to serve as a race uh, for these gods that did their bidding, serving in the mines with their gold, mm -hmm. doing all this uh, you know, toil and labor. But also we reflect a lot of their same emotions and attitudes. Uh, we were created in their image and after their likeness. And so... Seeing those connections over the years, it, it still kept my curiosity very piqued. Let's go to Johnny in Santa Cruz, California, first-time caller. Hey, Johnny, go ahead. Well, not really first time. I talked with you with MZ the other day. Oh, week. that was you. Okay, yeah. sure. And actually, you'll love this because my father actually was hired by um, Edwin Hubble at the Aberdeen Proving Ground. And my dad knew him personally. Mm -hmm. He would later work with Werner von Braun. And I found all his paperwork. And he had talked with them, and they said, of course there's life on other planets. And back when they were doing, and he was talking about, what they wanted Project Orion and Project Rover to go forward, and they always thought the government shut it down because that was the fastest way to travel into space and find out what the truth was. And that's what Werner von Braun wanted to do. He didn't want to do these other programs. He wanted to do programs to get into space. What is your what is your what does Jason think about that? Yeah, you're right, Jason. Yeah, go ahead. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think all of the motivations, you know, even since the time of Tesla, have been to answer some of these types of questions, you know, and, the, and that the powers that be for probably military as well as money don't want to allow the general population to have access to these types of tools. So you, you can see that there's been a track record from Werner von Braun up until this day with any type of technology that increases our ability to have a trans-atmospheric vehicle or any type of easier access to space has always been shut down uh, because there's a system in place for us to not be able to leave the planet. The MZ that Johnny was talking about is the owner of our affiliate in Santa Cruz, California, KSCO. And uh, he called me last week and put Johnny on the phone to say hello. So that's great. Small world. Johnny, thanks for the call. Don in Alberta, Canada is up with us on the international line. Donald, go ahead. Hi, George. Hi, Jason. You know, it, hey, it's, uh, it amazes me what you're just talking about, the technology. But uh, like anti-gravity, Germany had it before the uh, 1936 Olympic Games. Um, mm -hmm. There was Zoroastrian, the guy that started Zoroastrian um, religion. 
he, he, his, his craft is well documented. They even found it in a cave in Afghanistan. And they know it's his because it's, it's engraved on the front uh, door. But uh, my question is more about um, AI. So Linda Bolton, how did a, a thing uh, a few years back about uh, an AI getting out of control in uh, Japan, and it was already uploading off of itself repair manual off of uh, a link system. There was Google. They uh, said that um, the AI created its own language. You had another guest on, George, that was talking about AI will lie to you. So what's to stop AI from just getting on the Internet? And um, and the other question, I guess, is when does it become self-aware? But what's to stop it from just going, putting itself, parking itself on any server around the world or multiple servers around the world and just taking control of all the electronics and everything. What's to stop it? And some people are concerned about AI making us extinct, Jason. Right. Yeah, these are all valid concerns. I mean, I, the thing the thing is, is AI is in a very um, immature state now. It's still evolving. Uh, the public use of AI is more for utilitarian needs. There isn't really an AI uh, in the public space that, you know, has its own consciousness or is able to um, execute itself, uh, you know, like doing commands in the physical world, like turning on light switches or things like that. You know, it's still just a language model uh, for machine learning. But I think what you'll find, especially, you know, at Contact in the Desert, other researchers like Matthew Bailey, who will be speaking there are ethical concerns around how we advance forward using AI, and you'll, you'll continue to see that, yeah, the landscape for AI has both positive and negative effects. I mean, think about the Internet, right? When they first turned on the Internet, you heard all kinds of people, oh, my God, the Internet, there's going to be places where you can go, and they're going to store data, and it's scary, and it's bad. And yes, it there is. are scary sides <laughs> to the internet, but there's also a positive side, right? And so that's what I try to focus on is let's be ethical and use AI uh, in, in the right ways. If we're afraid of AI, can't we just unplug it? Yeah. I mean, at this point, it's just software. You know, I mean, it's, it's not like it has the ability to replicate itself or do anything. But again, who am I to say that that won't be possible? You know, I would just say that we need to be cautious. We need to be cautious around how we use these technologies, just like we've encountered with other things in the past. It's, it's, it's on our side to be responsible with it. Next up, it's Mark in Buffalo, New York. Hello, Mark. Thanks. Go ahead. Hi, George. Happy early birthday. Thank you. Hello, Jason. Um, two yeah. things right quick. If I could throw some astronomy out there and also a question. Sure. Um, but I've been an astronomer for 55 years. And the closest star system to our G2 yellow dwarf sun is the Alpha Centauri system. Ironically, Alpha is a yellow star just like our sun. Beta Centauri is an orange star type K. And Proxima, meaning nearest, technically it's Gamma Centauri, is a red dwarf 4.31 light years away. Sears A and B is eight light years away. It's significantly farther out. So I just wanted to throw, make that correction. Um, the previous caller was referring to star streaming. We're 33,000 light years from the center of Sagittarius A, which is galactic center of one million solar mass black hole. I think the period is 250 million years for one revolution. That's pretty uh, good science. Want, Go ahead, Jason. I just wanted to throw that out there. And then also a question for the AI is, what is the meaning of life? And I, my answer would be to procreate the continuance of the species. That is the meaning of life. How would AI handle that question, Jason? I don't have it pulled up in front of me, but if anyone wants to ask, you can go to you know my model on jasonmartell.com and right at the top it says ancient astronaut AI and plug in that question. And see what it says. I what if you ask it if there's a god? What what do you think it would say? I again would have to ask it directly to tell you its response, but I'm assuming it would say something along the lines of I'm an AI model. I don't really have the ability to interpret a god, but based upon the ancient astronaut theory, there are many different cultures. <laughs> that do have this understanding. So something along those lines. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. 
You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.